The Winter's Tale is the next to last play Shakespeare wrote before he retired. Um, it's one of the four plays called the last, called the Romances or tragic comedies sometimes. Officially it's a comedy, but it has the characteristics of those last plays, mystical stuff and magic and gods and so on. The play is based on a romance novel called Pandosto by Robert Greene, which was a very popular prose romance. And it went through, we know it's popular because it went through many editions. That's how we know things were popular in print in the time. Um, and the great thing about this play is that it, it changes the names, but it follows the story up to a point, and then at the end, it has a completely different ending. So even people who knew Pandosto well would have been shocked and surprised by the ending of the play. So that's Shakespeare's um, taking, borrowing, stealing, whatever you want to say, from many sources, the main one being that, and then molding it to his own purposes. Um, as we read through the play, I want you to watch what happens to the word grace, sort of the way the word nothing followed us through King Lear. Um, uh, watch how the word grace and graceful and gracious and graces run through the play. Uh, but I want to start with, um, well, act one, scene one, Archidamus and Camillo are talking. One is from so the play is divided in many different twos. There's Sicilia and there's Bohemia. And uh, don't get exercised by the fact that Bohemia has a sea coast. Everybody wonder, worries now, how can Shakespeare not know that Bohemia doesn't have a sea coast? There was a period when Bohemia did have a sea coast, but that may not have been uh, in Shakespeare's mind particularly. It doesn't matter. These are names from history and story and tradition. Uh, and he's setting them up as these two different places. The play is called The Winter's Tale. We'll see why in a little bit. Um, and we, he, he makes Cecilia a kind of wintry place and Bohemia a kind of spring summery place. Um, and we go from one to the other and then back again, just as in As You Like It, we went from the court to the forest and then back to the court. Um, and the same in other plays, where he has these two settings to show transformations. So the play starts with these two representatives of the two different courts, uh, Camillo and Archidamus. And they're peacefully and sweetly uh, praising one another for their entertainment and their kindness and, and generosity. It's a very positive little exchange, which ends with uh, the praise of Mamilius, the son of the king of Sicilia, Leontes, who gives this great promise of future, being a future good king. And then act one, scene two, um, everything begins sweetly, peacefully, comfortably, kindly. We have these two kings who are best friends and one of them is married to Hermione. Leontes, the king of Sicilia, is married to, to Hermione, and she's pregnant. And they have this older son, and they're about to have another child. And Polixenes, after nine months, has been there, uh, has to get back home. Why? He misses his family. He misses his son. And Leontes says, no, you've got to stay. You've got to stay. And Polixenes says, no, I really have to go. It's time. It's been nine months. I've, I've trespassed on your hospitality too long. So Leonti says to his wife, tongue-tied our queen, speak you at line 27. In other words, you invite him. I can't seem to persuade him. I really want him to stay, so you try. And she says, I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you had drawn oaths from him not to stay. I mean, he made him swear. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him you are sure all in Bohemia is well. This satisfaction the bygone day proclaimed. They heard news, everything's fine in Bohemia. Say this to him, he's beat from his best ward. Ward is a defensive position in fencing. 
so, or fighting. So um, he's beaten away from his defense if you say everything at home is fine. Well said, says Leontes. To tell he longs to see his son were strong, but let him say so then, and let him go. But let him swear so, and he shall not stay. Well, thwack him hence with distaffs. That is, the women will pick up their instruments, which is the distaff, and knock him out to go home. Why? To see his son. Yet of your royal presence, I'll adventure the borrow of a week. In other words, in any case, stay at least another week. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the jest prefixed for his party. When Leontes comes to you to visit you, you can keep him a month beyond the plan. Yet good deed, Leontes, I love thee not a jar of the clock behind what lady she, her lord. I love you no less than any woman loves her lord. You'll stay? No, madam. Nay, but you will. I may not verily, which is a nice, polite oath. Verily, says Hermione, you put me off with limber vows, but I, though you would speak to unsphere the stars with those, should yet say, sir, no going. Verily, you shall not go. A lady's verily is as potent as a lord's. Will you go yet? Force me to keep you as a prisoner, not like a guest, so you shall pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks. How say you, my prisoner or my guest? By your dread verily, one of them you shall be. Now, you're not to take this literally. She doesn't mean she's going to literally imprison him. She's not a fiend. This is courtly banter, okay? Very sweet, very... Um, warm, very lively. So he says, your guest then, madam, to be your prisoner should import offending, which is for me less easy to commit than you to punish. I couldn't possibly uh, want to offend you in any way. Therefore, I'll stay as your guest for another week and not as your prisoner, metaphorically. Hermione, not your jailer then, but your kind hostess. Come, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. You were pretty lordings then. We were, fair queen, two lads that thought there was no more behind but such a day tomorrow as today. And to be boy, eternal. Was not my lord the verier wag of the two? Wasn't he the kind of more uh, witty, rowdy, troublemaking one? The impish one? We were as twin lambs that did frisk in the sun and bleat the one at the other. What we changed was innocence for innocence. What we exchanged with each other was innocence for innocence. We knew not the doctrine of ill-doing, nor dreamed that any did. Had we pursued that life, and our weak spirits ne'er been higher reared, with stronger blood, we should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty. The imposition cleared hereditary ours. The hereditary imposition means original sin. We would have gone to heaven and said, not guilty of anything. If we'd continued in that way, we were as boys. Hermione says, by this we gather you have tripped, meaning fallen down, since. Polixenes, O oh, most sacred lady, temptations have since then been born to us, for in those unfledged days was my wife a girl. Your precious self had then not crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. In other words, we hadn't discovered girls yet. Hermione, grace to boot, meaning call, she's calling on grace to help, to boot, to, to be booty, to help us. Of this make no conclusion, lest you say your queen and I are devils, that is, we're the ones that caused you to trip. Yet go on, the offenses we have made you do, we'll answer. If you first sinned with us, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slipped not with any, but with us. So this is all this sexual implication of um, the, the fall, the fall of man tied to sexuality. And she says, um, don't blame us for causing your fall, because you'll call us devils. But if you slipped, meaning fell into sexual activity, only with us and not with anyone else, we'll take it. We'll, we'll pay whatever penalty. Why? Because marriage is a sacrament. It's not a sin. And sexuality within marriage is holy. So if that's the only way you've fallen, 
is with your wives in holy matrimony, no sin involved and will take whatever punishment there is. And Leonti says, is he one yet? And Hermione says, he'll stay, my lord. Leontes, at my request, he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spokest to better purpose. Okay, now, great quantities of critics will say, ah, at my request, he would not. He's already jealous. There's the grain. There's the dram of evil. But they're reading backward from what happens, which is a surprise. It can't be prepared for. That's the whole point of it. And we know it because the next thing he says is, Hermione, my dearest, thou never spoke to better purpose. I'm really glad you convinced him. She says, never? He says, never but once. What? She says, have I twice said well? Now this is more courtly banter. When was it before? I prithee, tell me. Cram us with praise and make us as fat as tame things. One good deed dying tongueless slaughters a thousand waiting upon that. Our praises are our wages. You may ride us with one soft kiss a thousand furlongs, ere with spur we heat an acre. You can get us to go a lot further with a kiss than with a spur. But to the goal, my last good deed was to entreat his stay. What was my first? It has an elder sister, or I mistake you. Oh, would her name were Grace. I hope my other good deed was, was graceful, was, was a form of grace. But once before I spoke to the purpose, when? Nay, let me have it, I long. Why, that was when three crabbed months had soured themselves to death ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself my love. That is, that was the time when you said, basically, I will, I do, I'll marry you. Then didst thou utter, I am yours forever. And she says, tis grace indeed. Why, lo you now, I have spoke to the purpose twice. The ones forever earned a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. Okay, everything's good till here. Everything's good till here. The friends are in harmony, the husbands and wives are in harmony, he's gonna stay an extra week, it's all good. And he gives her hand to Polixenes and they walk apart, and Leontes says, aside, meaning to us and no one else, too hot, too hot. To mingle friendship far as mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me, that is tremoring of the heart. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on, derive a liberty from hardiness, from bounty, fertile bosom, and well become the agent, may I grant. But to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are, and making practiced smiles as in a looking glass, and then to sigh as twere the mort of the deer, oh, that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Okay, so last, Thursday, we read all of Act 3, Scene 3 of Othello, and we had that unending, complicated, 600 and some line <coughs> temptation scene. Slowly weaving his way, Iago convinced Othello that his wife was unfaithful to him and turned him into the murderer of his wife. That was an amazing psychological study in how someone becomes jealous. This is also an equally amazing study because it happens absolutely suddenly, absolutely without warning, without preparation, without genesis, without cause, without Iago. It just springs into the mind. Shakespeare's play exists in the words. If we don't have words telling us something, it's not there. So yeah, you can play it that way, but it's, it would be a wrong. It would be a terrible mistake and destroys the whole point of this speech, which is the sudden infusion of what Shakespeare will call an affectio, which is a sudden invading passion. 
of the heart and of the mind, in, in, unexplained and inexplicable. And that's the point, that it's just happening. It's mysterious. The, the existence of Iago seems to be uh, supported by you know, his position. He's 28-year-old Venetian. He's got a job. He wants another job. Uh, and it turns out that Shakespeare goes to a lot of work to make us think of him not as just such a person, but as a demonic force. Well, now the demonic force is invisible and sudden. And it's going to disappear just as quickly as you'll see. But its appearance has to be sudden and unexplained. And that's because it's, it's the consequences of it that we're going to deal with. It's the part that human beings can do something about. They can't do anything about that sudden access of jealousy. It happens. O Othello couldn't make Iago not exist. There he was. And he didn't have a reason not to trust him. And Leontes doesn't see a reason not to trust himself or his, this affectio. So his bosom likes it not and his brows. His brows, remember, that means horns. He's afraid of horns. His brows are hardening with uh, cuckold's horns. Mamilius, art thou my boy? So now that has two meanings. Are you, my, are, you, are you my boy? Well, of course I am. Yeah, but are you really mine? But we don't know that yet. It's coming. I, my good lord, says Mamilius. Effects, meaning in faith. Why, that's my bawcock. What, has smutched thy nose? They say it is a copy out of mine. Come, captain, we must be neat. And then he stops himself. Not neat, but cleanly, captain. And yet the steer, the heifer, and the calf are all called neat. Neat is a word for uh, cattle, right? Bovine cattle. Neat's foot oil. You've heard of neat's foot oil, I'm sure. Or maybe not. But anyway, he's thinking about cattle who have horns. It's a whole, the whole theme is about horns. Now he looks over and they're holding hands, Polixenes and Hermione, still virginaling upon his palm. You know what a virginal is? It's a little keyboard instrument, like a mini harpsichord. He's virginaling on, her, on his, she's virginaling on his palm. How now, you wanton calf, he says to Mamilius, art thou my calf? Yes, if you will, my lord. Calf now still with the, with the cattle imagery, the horns. Thou wants the rough passion shoots that I have, that's horns again, to be full like me. Yet they say we are almost as like as eggs. Women say so, that will say anything. But were they false as ore dyed blacks, as wind, as waters, false as dice are to be wished by one that fixes no born twixt his and mine, yet were it true to say this boy were like me. In other words, he does look like me. Come, Sir Page, look on me with your welkin eyes, got blue eyes, welkin means the heavens. Sweet villain, my dearest, my collop, most dearest, my collop, can thy dam, that is, can your mother, may it be, Affection, that's the word I used before. Thy intention stabs the center. What does that mean? Affection is this invasion of a passion, of an idea that overwhelms you and takes you over. And it's getting to the heart of things, he says. Thou dost make possible things not so held, communicates with dreams. How can this be? With what's unreal, thou coactive art and fellowest nothing. Affection can make dreams seem real. Affection can attach itself to what doesn't exist and make it believable. So what he ought to say then is, this is an affection that I ought not to believe because it's connecting me with nonsense this adulterous idea of her. But what he says instead is, then tis very credent thou mayest conjoin with something. Since an affectio can attach itself to, a, to, to nothing, how much more powerful will it be if it's attached to something? In other words, if there's a real cause for it. And thou dost, 
and that be on commission, and I find it, and that to the infection of my brains and the hardening of my brows. So this affectio of jealousy that I'm suddenly feeling is based on something real, and I've found it out, and it's illicit, and it's tormenting me and growing me horns. So Polixenes looks over and sees him agitated. What means Sicilia? Right, he's calling him by the, he's the king of Sicilia, so he's called by his country's name. Hermione, he something seems unsettled. How, my lord, says Polixenes. Leontes pretends. What cheer, how is it with you, best brother? Hermione, you look as if you held the brow of much distraction. Are you moved, my lord? No, in good earnest. How sometimes nature will betray its folly, its tenderness, and make itself a pastime to harder bosoms. He's pretending, and he's going to tell us he is. Because everything's in the words. If he doesn't tell us, we're not sure. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methought I did recoil 23 years and saw myself unbreached in my green velvet coat, my dagger muzzled lest it should bite its master, and so prove, as ornaments oft do, too dangerous. How like, methought, I was then to this colonel, this squash, this gentleman. Mine honest friend, he says to Mamilius, his son, will you take eggs for money? No, my lord, I'll fight. You will? Why, happy man be as dull. That is, may the winner win, the best man win, or something like that. My brother, are you so fond of your young prince as we do seem to be of ours? Polixenes says, if at home, sir, he's all my exercise my mirth, my matter. Now my sworn friend, and then mine enemy, my parasite, my soldier, statesman, all. He makes a July's day short as December, and with his varying childness cures in me thoughts that would thick my blood. One of the most beautiful descriptions of a father's joy in his young son. Leonti, so stands this squire of office with me. We too will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. Hermione, how thou lovest us, show in our brother's welcome. That is, keep welcoming him. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he's apparent to my heart. Now that's something he would have said before, too hot, too hot. She says, if you would seek us, we are yours in the garden. Shall us attend you there. Garden. They're going out to the garden to walk. Yeah, but the garden, what garden? We're about to see a crashing collapse, a crashing driving out of the Garden of Eden. He says, to your own bents dispose you, you'll be found, be you beneath the sky. I'll find you wherever you are. And then he says aside, I'm angling now, fishing, though you perceive me not how I give line. Go to, go to, how she holds up the neb, the bill to him, and arms her with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. They go out. Gone already? Inch thick, knee deep, or head and ears, a forked one. Horns. Go play, boy, play, thy mother plays, and I play too, but so disgraced apart, there's that anti-version of the word grace, whose issue will hiss me to my grave. It sounds like Othello, right? His reputation, his name. Contempt and clamor will be my knell. Go play, boy, play. There have been, or I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now. And many a man there is, even at this present, now, while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, that little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence, and his pond fished by his next neighbor, by Sir Smile, his neighbor. Nay, there's comfort in it, whilst other men have gates, and those gates opened as mine against their will. There's comfort in it, as long as I know I'm not the only cuckold in the world. Should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. Physic, meaning medicine for it, there's none. It is a bawdy planet that will strike where tis predominant. And tis powerful think, he doesn't mean the earth is a bawdy planet. He means the planet in charge of bawdiness is coming into conjunction and will strike and cause bawdiness on earth. Um, 
that will strike where it is predominant and tis powerful think it from east, west, north, south. Be it concluded, no barricado for a belly. Know it. It will let in and out the enemy with bag and baggage. Many thousand on us have the disease and feel it not. Look where his mind has taken him, extrapolating from his own fantasy of his situation to the world. How now, boy? Mamilius, I am like you, they say. That was the theme his father raised with him before. Why, that's some comfort. What, Camillo there? Aye, my good lord. Go play, Mamilius, thou art an honest man. Uh, uh, Mamilius goes out. Now, this jealousy, this sudden access of this affectio is not just poisoning Leontes' mind. Because he's a king, and has power. It is like dropping a rock in a pond, in a still pond, and the rings move outward and outward and outward through the entire first half of the play. The rings of Leontes' jealousy, of his mad affectio, widen to take in one after another of the people in his life and in his court to the point where everybody is, is um, accused by him of collusion in this adultery that doesn't exist. So he starts with Camillo, his prime minister in charge. Camillo, this great sir will stay longer. Camillo, you had much ado to make his anchor hold when you cast out it still, meaning always came home. Didst perceive it? So, you had a hard time getting him to stay, but he stayed. Leontes thinks this means, aha, they're here with me already, whispering, rounding. Cecilia is a so forth. In other words, Cecilia is a cuckold. Tis far gone when I shall gust it last. Remember that the horns are invisible to everybody, to the, to the man who has them, and invisible to everybody else. But Leontes here is reversing it. To him, they're real, and everyone else can't see them because there aren't any. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Tis far gone when I shall gust me and taste it last. How came it, Camillo, that he did stay? At the good queen's entreaty. At the queen's, be it. Good should be pertinent, but so it is, it is not. You get it? Good should pertain to her, but as things are, it doesn't. Was this taken by any understanding pate, meaning head, but thine? For thy conceit is soaking, will draw in more than the common blocks. Like a sponge, it takes in knowledge. Not noted is it, but of the, first, above, of the finer natures, by some severals of headpiece extraordinary. Lower messes, perchance, are to this business purblind. Say, are you the only one that has seen that she's adulterous with Polixenes besides me, or does everybody catching on? Business, my lord? Camillo doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. I think most understand Bohemia stays here longer. Huh? Stays here longer. Aye, but why? to satisfy your highness and the entreaties of our most gracious mistress. Satisfy the entreaties of your mistress. Satisfy, let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart, as well my chamber counsels wherein priest-like thou hast cleansed my bosom. I've always trusted you. You've always given me good advice. I from thee departed thy penitent reformed. But we have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that which seems so. Now he's calling Camillo a deceiver. Okay, he started by thinking that his wife is a deceiver and his best friend. Now he's gone to Camillo. Be it forbid, my lord. He jumps on the line in that which seems so. Be it forbid, my lord, he says right away. To bide upon it, thou art not honest. Or, if thou inclinest that way, thou art a coward, which hooks, hoxes honesty behind, restraining from course required. Or else thou must be counted a servant grafted in my serious trust and therein negligent. Or else a fool, 
that seest the game played home, the rich stake drawn, and takes it all for jest. So he's accused him of four things. And Camillo is now going to defend himself on those four accounts. My gracious Lord, I may be negligent, foolish, and fearful. In every one of these, no man is free, but that his negligence, his folly, fear among the infinite doings of the world sometimes puts forth. In your affairs, my Lord, if ever I were willful negligent, it was my folly. If industriously I played the fool, it was my negligence, not weighing well the end. If ever fearful to do a thing where I the issue doubted, whereof the ex execution did cry out against the non-performance, t'was a fear which oft infects the wisest. These, my Lord, are such allowed infirmities that honesty is never free of. But beseech your grace, be plainer with me. Let me know my trespass by its own visage. If I deny it, tis none of mine. Have you not seen, Camillo? But that's past doubt. You have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn. I just want to stop to, to get you to notice how Leonti's speech from too hot, too hot is so punctuated with interruptions of himself, so jumping around, almost, almost as much as Othello's after he's killed Desdemona, which we talked about Thursday. He is in such a state of agitation that he can't think straight and put thoughts together in a normal kind of unfolding way. He's just bouncing and jumping and bouncing and jumping. So even here, have you not seen Camillo, but that's past doubt you have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn, notice the metaphor, or heard, for to a vision so apparent rumor cannot be mute, or thought, for cogitation resides not in that man that does not think, my wife is slippery, if thou wilt confess, or else be impudently negative, to have nor eyes, nor ears, nor thought, then say, my wife's a hobby horse, deserves a name as rank as any flax wench that puts to before her troth plight. Say it, and justify it. Uh, See that thou prove my wife a whore, says Othello in the earlier play. Camillo, of course, is shocked. I would not be a stander by to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so without my present vengeance taken. Shrew my heart. You never spoke what did become you less than this, which to reiterate were sin as deep as that, though true. Leontes cannot hear him. Is whispering nothing? Is leaning cheek to cheek? Is meeting noses, kissing with inside lip? Has he ever seen her kiss Polixenes with inside lip? No. no. This doesn't exist. This is in his own imagination. Stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, meaning wishing hours, minutes, wishing noon, midnight, so that they could go to bed together, and all eyes blind with the pin and web, but theirs, theirs only, that would unseen be wicked. Is this nothing? Why then the world and all that's in it's nothing. The covering sky is nothing, Bohemia nothing, my wife is nothing, nor nothing have these nothings if this be nothing. Good my Lord, be cured of this diseased opinion. And betimes, meaning quickly, for tis most dangerous. Say it be, tis true. No, no, my Lord. It is, you lie, you lie. I say thou liest, Camillo, and I hate thee. Pronounce thee a gross lout, a mindless slave, or else a hovering temporizer that canst with thine eyes at once see good and evil inclining to them both. Were my wife's liver infected as her life, she would not live the running of one glass. Okay, Camillo's in a bind now. It's his king and lord telling him. Who does infect her? Why, he that wears her like, a, like her medal hanging about his neck. Bohemia. 
who, if I had servants true about me that bear eyes and see alike mine honor as their prophets to their own particular thrifts, they would do that which should undo more doing. If I had loyal servants about me that cared more about my honor than about their own advancement, they'd undo his doing, meaning they'd take him off, kill him. I and thou, his cupbearer, whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship, that is, I've raised you up from a lower status to the highest, who mayest see plainly as heaven sees earth and earth sees heaven how I am galled, might spice a cup to give mine enemy a lasting wink, which draft to me were cordial. Give him poison, and that's giving a cordial to me. Sir, my lord, I could do this, and that with no rash potion, but with a lingering dram that should not work maliciously like poison. Yeah, I could do it. But I cannot believe this crack to be in my dread mistress so sovereignly being honorable. I have loved thee. Make that thy question and go rot. Thus think I am so muddy, so unsettled to appoint myself in this vexation, sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve is sleep, which being spotted is goads, thorns, nettles, tails of wasps. Give scandal to the blood of the prince, my son, who I do think is mine and love as mine, without right moving to it? Don't you think I have plenty of reason to say this? Would I do this? Could man so blench? We're seeing it happen. Can this happen to someone? Can he become so jealous that he undermines his whole own life and family and servants and kingdom because he believes this fantasy? Can it happen? We're seeing it happen. Camillo, I must believe you, sir. I do, and will fetch off Bohemia for it. Okay, I'll do it. Provided that when he's removed, your highness will take again your queen as yours at first, even for your son's sake, and thereby for sealing the injury of tongues in courts and kingdoms known and allied to yours. I'll do it if you promise to take her back and keep it quiet for the good of the kingdom. Leontes, thou dost advise me even so as I mine own course have set down. I give no blemish to her honor, none. I will give no blemish to her honor. My lord, go then, and with a countenance as clear as friendship wears at feasts, keep with Bohemia and with your queen. I am his cupbearer. If from me have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. So what's going to happen? He's not going to give him poison. He's going to be accounted not Leontes' servant, right? He's going to run off with Polixenes. We don't know that yet. That this is all, says Leontes. Do it, and thou hast the one half of my heart. Do it not, thou splitst thine own. You're a dead man, basically. I'll do it, my lord. This is I, like a mafia. Yeah. Sicily. Yeah, except this is not practice with him. This is not normal, no. right? This is because of this overwhelming, sudden jealousy that he's feeling. I will seem friendly as thou hast advised me. He goes out. Camillo has a soliloquy. Oh, miserable lady. But for me, what case stand I in? I must be the poisoner of good Polixenes. And my ground to do it is the obedience to a master, one who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. What does this mean? Okay, rebellion is bad in Shakespeare, right? Whatever level you're at, rebellion is bad, against, particularly against the rightful authority. So the rebel angels against God are bad, and a rebel against the rightful king, like Macbeth, is bad. And in yourself, there's a hierarchy. Whoops, did I make a mess here? <laughs> in, your, in yourself, there's a hierarchy of um, authority. And it goes, as Plato said, from the mind or the reason to the heart or the will or the feelings to the physical body. And if, you, if the lower uh, elements, in this case passion, rebel against reason, then this is also bad. 
So he is in rebellion with himself, and therefore he wants everybody who is his in rebellion too. In other words, he's not only turning himself against Hermione and Polixenes, he's turning me against them. To do this deed, promotion follows. If I could find example of thousands that had struck anointed kings and flourished after, I'd not do it. Even if, that is. I, there were a thousand examples of people killing a king and succeeding, I'd not do it. But since nor brass, nor stone, nor parchment bears not one, that is all the ways that history records itself, let villainy itself forswear it. I must forsake the court. To do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. If I kill him, I'm destroyed. If I don't, I'm also destroyed. Happy star reign now. Here comes Bohemia. Enter Polixenes. This is strange. Methinks the favor here begins to warp, not speak. That is, Leontes has walked by him and not said anything. He thinks he's going to pretend to be normal and unmoved, but he can't do it. Good day, Camillo. Hail the most royal, sir. What is the news in the court? None rare, my lord. The king hath on him such a countenance as he had lost some province and a region loved as he loves himself. Even now I met him with customary compliment when he, wafting his eyes to the contrary and falling a lip of much contempt, speeds from me and so leaves me to consider what is breeding that changes thus his manners. I dare not know, my lord. How, dare not? Do not? Do you know and dare not? Be intelligent to me. That is, tell me what's going on. Tis thereabouts for to yourself what you do know you must and cannot say you dare not. Well, it's just not logical. What do you mean you dare not know? You either know it or you don't know it. Good Camillo, your changed complexions are to me a mirror which shows me mine changed too. For I must be a party in this alteration, finding myself thus altered with it. Camillo, there is a sickness which puts some of us in dis distemper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that yet are well. How caught of me? Make not, me not sighted like the basilisk. When, you, when the basilisk looks at you, it kills you. Okay, so they go on, and finally, and Camillo convinces Polixenes that, yes, the aunties thinks he's, and, and Polixenes is outraged. He, he says, you've touched his queen forbiddingly, forbiddenly, line 416. Oh, then my best blood turned to an infected jelly, and my name be yoked with his that did betray the best. Yoked with whose name? Judas. Judas. That's another argument for my reading of Judean instead of Indian in Othello. <laughs> Same situation. Turn then my freshest reputation to a savor that may strike the dullest nostril where I arrive, and my approach be shunned, nay, hated too, worse than the greatest infection that e'er was heard around. He's shocked and horrified that anyone would think this. And then he says, I do, line 445, I do believe thee. I saw his heart in his face. So then he says, okay, I'm getting out of here. Camillo says, you got to get out of here little by little and run away and, I, and take me with you because I can't stay. I'll be killed. Take the urgent hour comes her away. Let us avoid. Um, Polixenes says at 456, fear or shades me. Good expedition be my friend and comfort the gracious queen. Part of his theme, but nothing of his ill tain suspicion. Ill-taken suspicion. There is no truth in this suspicion. All right, scene, act two, scene one. Hermione and um, the ladies, her ladies-in-waiting, uh, are playing with Mamilius. And there's a lot of kind of courtly byplay, comical byplay, and he's, he's a smart little mouth, this Mamilius, talking about the brows of 
the ladies and the way they put on makeup. And um, he learns it from ladies' faces, watching them at court. But his mother says, and she's pregnant, so she's getting some pain. So she walks away. And then she comes back and she says, tell us a story. Sit, pray you sit by us and tell us a tale. Mamilius, merry or sad shall it be? I'm at line 23. As merry as you will. Mamilius, a sad tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Let's have that, good sir. Come on, sit down. Come on and do your best to fright me with your sprites. You're powerful at it. There was a man, says Mamilius. Nay, come sit down, then on. Dwelt by a churchyard. And that's all we hear of that story. But that's enough, right? You're going to hear ghosts and sprites and goblins. There was a man dwelt by a churchyard. A sad tale's best for winter. The title of the play is The Winter's Tale. It's a sad, meaning not just unhappy, but sober, serious, grave. Leontes bursts in, takes Mamilius from Hermione. She says, what is this sport? And he says, take the boy away. I don't want him near his mother. She says, let her sport herself, line 60, with that she's big with. For tis Polix, and he picks up her word. You see, she says, what is this sport? Bear the boy hence, he shall not come about her. Away with him, and let her sport herself with that she's big with, meaning the child in her womb. For tis Polixenes hath made thee swell thus. Hermione, but I'd say he had not. And I'll be sworn you would believe my saying, however you lean to the nay word. You, my lords, look on her, mark her will. Be but about to say she's a goodly lady, and the justice of your hearts will thereto add, tis pity she's not honest, honorable. She's an adulteress. That's the end of that speech. Hermione, should a villain say so, the most replenished villain in the world, he were as much more villain. You, my lord, do but mistake. Now, this is why she forgives him in the end. Because she knows who he really is. And this is a terrible error. It is not in his nature. It is an invasion. You have mistook, my lady, Polixenes for Leontes. Oh, thou thing. I'm not going to read all of his attack, but you see how it's spreading. So it's got to uh, Camillo, it's got to Polixenes, it's got to Hermione here, now it's got to Mamilius, then it's got to the lords. You've got to agree with me that she's not honest, that she's an adulteress. Hermione says, uh, line 95, no, by my life, privy to none of this. That is, nothing of what you're saying is true. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge that you thus have published me? Gentle, my lord, you scarce can write me throughly then to say you did mistake. You're going to have a hard time making this right to me even if you recognize that you're making a mistake. No, he says. If I mistake in those foundations which I build upon, the center is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. He means the center of the earth is not big enough. The, the, the globe of the earth is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. If I'm making a mistake. Away with her to prison. He who shall speak for her is a far off guilty, but that he speaks. Just speaking for her makes you a guilty party. So she can't argue with him, and she realizes it. Now she says this. There's some ill planet reigns. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favorable. Remember what patient means. Willingness to bear affliction. Not just needing to wait, but the willingness to bear the suffering imposed when you can't do anything about it. Good my lords, I am not prone to weeping as our sex commonly are, the want of which vain Jew, 
perchance shall dry your pities. The fact that I'm not crying might make you not pity me. But I have that honorable grief lodged here, which burns worse than, worse than tears drown. Beseech you all, my lords, with thoughts so qualified as your charities shall best instruct you, measure me. And so the king's will be, for, be, be performed. Shall I be heard? Meaning get her to prison. Who is it that goes with me? Beseech your highness that my women may be with me, for you see my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fool. So she, my plight means she's pregnant. She's about to give birth. And there, her women are weeping. She says, do not weep, good fools. There is no cause. When you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears as I come out. In other words, if you know I deserve prison, you should weep if I'm not in prison. But don't weep that I'm going to prison when I don't deserve it. This action I now go on is for my better grace. Adieu, my lord. I never wished to see you sorry. Now I trust I shall. My women come, you have leave. All right, so out they go. What's she saying here? She recognizes that she's being tested, that this is an affliction, not of her making. And she has chosen to bear it with patience and imagine that ultimately some good will come out of it. She doesn't know how. All right, then in the rest of the scene, Leontes goes to work on the rest of the lords in the court. And they keep saying, no, no, she can't be. This isn't true. And he says, yes, you're traitors. You're, if you don't believe me, you're all betraying me. So he accuses Antigonus of being ignorant or else a fool at line 174. Camillo has flown with Polixenes. He's going to have a trial. And then he says at line 180, yet for greater confirmation, for in an act of this importance to her most piteous to be wild, I shouldn't be wild in this. Well, he is by definition wild. I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos to Apollo's temple, Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know of stuffed sufficiency. Now from the oracle they will bring all whose spiritual counsel had shall stop or spur me. Have I done well? <clears throat> he imagines, as Othello imagined, that he could, if he suspected Desdemona, he could prove one way or the other, prove her innocent, prove her guilty, and then... So he thinks, okay, the oracle is going to stop me from doing this or spur me on. He, can, he intellectually imagines it both ways. But what's he assuming? But the oracle is going to say, you're right. She's unfaithful. Have I done well? Well done, my lord. Though I am satisfied and need no more than what I know, yet shall the oracle give rest to the minds of others, such as he whose ignorant credulity will not come up to the truth. In other words, the oracle is going to prove me right. And I'm, I don't need convincing, but other people do. <clears throat> so we have thought it good from our free person she should be confined, lest that the treachery of the two fled hence be left her to perform. So he has accused them of attempting his life on his life, which they haven't. And he's afraid she's going to make an attempt on his life, which of course she won't. <clears throat> so he's put her in prison, he says, that's why. Come, follow us. We are to speak in public. For this business will raise us all. And Antigonus says aside, to laughter, as I take it, if the good truth were known. In other words, this is absurd, this accusation. <clears throat> now we get a new character, Paulina. She's a remarkable woman. She is um, in the line of wise women of the ancient world, of biblical proportions almost. She's come to the prison, 
with an idea. And she finds out that the queen has given birth to a girl, a baby girl, <clears throat> lusty and like to live. The queen receives much comfort in it, says, my poor prisoner, I'm as innocent as, I'm innocent as you. Line about 30. You see where I am? Act two, scene two, line about 30. Paulina, I dare be sworn. These dangerous, unsafe loons, meaning lunacies in the king, beshrew them, curse them. He must be told on it, and he shall. These men, these lords at court, aren't strong enough in standing up to him, but I'm going to do it. The office becomes a woman best. I let my tongue blister and never to my red-looked anger be the trumpet any more. Uh, sorry. The office becomes a woman best. I'll take it upon me. If I prove honey-mouthed, let my tongue blister and never to my red-looked anger be the trumpet any more. Pray you, Amelia, commend my best obedience to the queen. If she dares trust me with her little babe, I'll show the king, I'll show it the king and undertake to be her advocate to the loudest. We do not know how he may soften at the sight of the child. The silence often of pure innocence persuades when speaking fails. Amelia says, that's the, the queen's waiting gentlewoman. Most worthy madam, by the way, Amelia, remember her? <laughs> Iago's wife? Your honor and your goodness is so evident that your free undertaking cannot miss a thriving issue. The outcome has to be a success. There is no lady living so meet, meaning so appropriate, for this great errand. Please your ladyship to visit the next room. I'll presently acquaint the queen of your noble offer, most noble offer who but today hammered of this design, but durst not tempt a minister of honor lest she should be denied. The queen had the same idea. Tell her, Amelia, I'll use that tongue I have. If wit flow from it as boldness from my bosom, let it not be doubted I shall do good. Now be you blessed for it. I'll to the queen, please you come something nearer. The jailer says, Madam, if it please the queen to send the babe, I know not what I shall incur to pass it, having no warrant. The king hasn't given me any warrant to let this infant girl out of jail. And Paulina says, you need not fear it, sir. This child was prisoner to the womb and is by law and process of great nature, thence freed and enfranchised, not a party to the anger of the king, nor guilty of, if any be, the trespass of the queen. Jailer, I do believe it. Do not you fear. Upon mine honor, I will stand betwixt you and danger. So the child has been freed from the womb by the law and process of great nature. That idea of great nature is going to return in the second half of the play. It's going to be called great creating nature. In the words of whom? Perdita. Right? About whom Paulina is saying this now. All right. What happens? Mamilius gets sick. He's wasting away. He's outraged, horrified at his mother's disgrace. And he's not doing well. Paulina bursts in with the baby. You must not enter. Nay, rather, good my lords, be second to me. Fear you his tyrannous passion more or less than the queen's life? A gracious, innocent soul more free than he is jealous. She is more uh, free of sin than he is full of jealousy. He hath not slept tonight. Commanded none should come at him. Not so hot, good sir, now. Too hot, too hot was the beginning of all this, right? Not so hot, good sir. I come to bring him sleep. Tis such as you that creep like shadows by him and do sigh at each his needless heavings. Such as you nourish the cause of his awaking. I do come with words as medicinal as true. Sorry, I do, com I do come with words as medicinal as true. Medicinal. 
honest as either, to purge him of that humor that presses him from sleep. This is all uh, uh, medical metaphors, right? Purging him of humor. What noise is there? Ho, no noise, my lord, but needful conference about some gossips for your highness. How? Away with that audacious lady. He sees who she is. Antigonus, I charge thee that she should not come about me. I knew she would. <laughs> I knew she would. <coughs> I told her so, my lord, on your displeasure's peril and on mine, she should not visit you. What, canst not rule her? Paulina, from all dishonesty he can. In this, unless he take the course that you have done, commit me for committing honor, trust it, he shall not rule me. Lie you now, you hear? When she will take the rein, I let her run, but she'll not stumble. Okay, it's a, it's a horse metaphor, true. <laughs> but when she wants to take over, I let her, because she knows what she's doing in those moments. Good my liege, I come, and I beseech you hear me, who professes myself your loyal servant, your physician, your most obedient counselor, yet that dares less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seem yours. I say I come from your good queen. I, I seem to be contradicting you, but it's for your good because I'm not going to uh, second you and support you in your evils. From your good queen, good queen, good queen, my lord, good queen, I say good queen. And would by combat make her good, so were I a man, the worst about you. If I were the worst man about, uh, of all these lords in the court, I would by combat justify her. Leontes, force her hence. Let him that makes but trifles of his eyes first hand me. You touch me, you lose your eyes. On mine own accord I'll off, but first I'll do my errand. The good queen, for she is good, hath brought you forth a daughter. Here it is, commends it to your blessing. Out, a mankind witch! Hence with her out of door a most intelligencing bawd. Now he's accusing Paulina of being a go-between. Not so, she says. I am as ignorant in that as you, in so entitling me and no less honest than you are mad, which is enough, I'll warrant, as this world goes, to pass for honest. Traitors, he says to the lords, will you not push her out? Give her the bastard, thou dotard, thou art woman tired, unroosted by thy dame partlet here. Take up the bastard, take it up, I say, give it to thy crone. He says this to Antigonus, Paulina's husband. Paulina, forever unvenerable be thy hands, uh, sorry, forever unvenerable be thy hands if thou takest up the princess by that forced baseness which he has put upon it. Leontes, ha, he dreads his wife. So would, so I would you did. Then twere past all doubt you'd call your children yours. A nest of traitors. So you see how the circle has spread. Now they're all traitors for not driving Paulina out because he doesn't want to hear it. Antigonus, brave enough to say, I am none by this good light. Nor I, nor any one that's here, and that's himself. For he, the sacred honor of himself, his queens, his hopeful sons, his babes, betrays to slander, whose sting is sharper than the swords. And will not, for as the case now stands, it is a curse, he cannot be compelled to it. Once remove the root of his opinion, which is rotten as ever oak or stone was sound. That's the idea I was trying to get across. He's put everybody else to the suffering of slander, and he's doing the slander. And he cannot root out this opinion, which is rotten. He says, it's the issue of Polixenes, the baby. And Paulina says, line 90, whatever it is, seven, five. It is yours, says Paulina, and might we lay the old proverb to your charge, so like you, tis the worse. Behold, my lords, although the print be little, the whole matter and copy of the father, 
eye, nose, lip, the trick of his frown, his forehead, nay, the valley, the pretty dimples of his chin and cheek, his smiles, the very mold and frame of hand, nail, finger. And thou, good goddess nature, which hast made it so like him that got it, meaning begot it, if thou hast the ordering of the mind too, amongst all colors, no yellow in it, <laughs> lest she suspect as he does her children, not her husbands. She's ex exactly like you. Now, of course, you can have your opinion about how much an infant child can look like one or the other parent, but the words are telling us that she does. And we're to believe it because Paulina doesn't lie. And she calls out on nature to say, if her mind is like her father's too, noble, royal, masterful, let it not have any yellow in it, meaning jealousy. Or she's going to suspect her children of not being her own husbands. She's going to suspect herself of adultery. When, of course, she must know that she hasn't committed it. A gross hag. Uh, you will not stay her tongue. Antigonus, hang all the husbands that cannot do that feat. You'll leave yourself hardly one subject. You can laugh. The audience laughs. Take her hence. I'll have thee burnt, says Leontes, as a witch. Paulina, I care not. It is an heretic that makes the fire, not she which burns in it. I'll not call you tyrant, but this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy, something savors of tyranny and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. On your allegiance, out of the chamber with her. Were I a tyrant, where were her life? If I were a tyrant, she'd be dead already. She durst not call me so if she did know me one. Away with her. I pray you do not push me. I'll be gone. Look to your babe, my lord, tis yours. Jove send her a better guiding spirit. What needs these hands? They're pushing her out. You that are thus so tender or his follies will never do him good, not one of you. So, so farewell, we are gone. Then he says to Antigonus, thou traitor hast set on thy wife to this. No, I didn't. All right, what would you be willing to do to justify he says, anything, anything. Okay, I'll tell you what. Take the baby, go to some desert place, and expose it there so that it'll die in the hands of nature, not in the hands of caring human beings. And because he has sworn, he has to do it. He swore to it before he knew what it was. So he takes up the baby and goes off to do that. And then we hear that Cleomenes and Dion have returned from the oracle. And then we have Act 3, Scene 1, which is one of those tiny little scenes in Shakespeare that uh, often directors cut, but that lends the tone and the preparation for the meaning of what's going to follow. And so I'm going to read it. It's short. They've just, they're on their way back from the oracle at Delphi. Cleomenes, the climate's delicate, the air most sweet, fertile the isle, the temple much surpassing the common praise it bears. So everything was good, good climate, sweet air. Temple's greater than even praise has described it. Dion says, I shall report for most it caught me the celestial habits, methinks I so should term them, and the reverence of the grave wearers. Oh, the sacrifice, how ceremonious, solemn, and unearthly it was in the offering. So you go to Delphi, you, you offer to the god Apollo, and, and then the women in charge of the uh, oracle offer up those sacrifices, and they bear the question to the oracle herself, who is an old woman who sits over a tripod over a a um, burning pit, usually they say of sulfur, and then goes into a trance. And then the god speaks through her voice 
the answer to the question. Now, that tradition started out as a mythic kind of ancient idea. And there really was a temple there, and there really were oracles. And it became a very powerful political instrument later in history. Uh, people would go consult it and then report what it said. Uh, even in Plato's time, uh, Socrates' friend, um, Socrates' friend, what's his name? Go, went to the oracle and asked it um, something. And the oracle said, there's no man wiser than Socrates, and came back and told him. Um, Chirophon, Chirophon? I think it's Chirophon. Comes back and tells him, there's no man wiser than Socrates. Um, and Socrates spends his whole life trying to disprove that oracular utterance and finds out that it, it's not false. It's true, not because he's so wise, but because he knows he doesn't know and others. Anyway, and then there's a famous oracle of, the, of Delphi that says, if you go to this battle, a great army will be destroyed. And the guy says, great. And he goes off and fights. And his is the army that's destroyed. So there was a lot of uh, double talk later and a lot of political kind of abuse of the idea. But Shakespeare is going back to this earlier image of the oracle as this pure ceremonious vehicle of knowledge from the, from the gods. And he's telling us that by giving us this description. <clears throat> Cleomenes says, but of all the burst and ear deafening voice of the oracle, kin to Jove's thunder, so surprised my sense that I was nothing. It nearly knocked me out or it did knock me out. Dion, if the event, meaning outcome of the journey, prove as successful to the queen, oh, be it so, as it hath been to us, rare, pleasant, speedy, the time is worth the use on it. Cleomenes, great Apollo, turn all to the best. These proclamations so forcing faults upon Hermione, I little like. Dion, the violent carriage of it will clear or end the business. When the oracle thus by Apollo's great divine sealed up, shall the contents discover something rare even then will rush to knowledge. Go, fresh horses and gracious, there's that word again, be the issue. Now they don't know what the oracle has said. It's been sealed up. But they're preparing us to recognize that when the oracle's, uh, the message from the oracle is unsealed and read, it's going to be something rare and important and it's going to rush to knowledge. We're going to know it. And they hope, of course, that it's to a good issue because they don't like what's going on, rightly. OK, Act 3, Scene 2. Leontes. Sessions means court sessions, right? The meeting of the court. This sessions to our great grief we pronounce even pushes against our heart. The party tried the daughter of a king, our wife, and one of, us too much, uh, one of us too much beloved. Let us be cleared of being tyrannous, since we so openly proceed in justice, which shall have due course even to the guilt or the purgation, produce the prison. OK, we're having a fair court of justice here. I mean, secretly, I know that she's guilty, but <clears throat> we're going to proceed by law, so everyone's convinced. They read the indictment. Committed adultery with Polixenes, conspiring with Camilla to take away the life of our sovereign lord, etc. Hermione responds. Line 21. If this scene does not convince you that Hermione is not a weakling, nothing in Shakespeare will. Since what I am to say must be but that which contradicts my accusation, and the testimony on my part no other but what comes from myself, it shall scarce boot me to say not guilty. Since I don't, there can't be any testimony to prove my innocence. It's the same problem as we had in Othello. What good is it going to do me to say not guilty? Mine integrity, being counted falsehood, shall, as I express it, be so received. So she could say, so I'm not going to say anything. What good will it do? Give up. But she doesn't. But thus, she says, 
If powers divine behold our human actions as they do, so that's both the if that all human beings live in, do the gods, does God watch what we're doing? Does it matter ultimately? And then she says in her confession of faith, they do. If powers divine behold our human actions as they do, I doubt not then but innocence shall make false accusation blush and tyranny tremble at patience. Innocence is herself, false accusation is Leontes, tyranny is Leontes, patience is herself. So it's a kind of chiasmus, ABBA structure, using abstract generalizations. But she embodies innocence and patience, and he embodies false accusation and tyranny. But he will blush and tremble. Now she speaks directly to him. You, my Lord, best know, who least will seem to do so. My past life hath been as continent, as chaste, as true, as I am now unhappy, which is more than history can pattern, though devised and plays to take, played to take spectators. And here we are, spectators, watching her say this on a stage. For behold me, a fellow of the royal bed, which owe, meaning own, a moiety of the throne, that is half the throne, a great king's daughter, the mother to a hopeful prince, here standing to prate and talk for life and honor, for who please to come in here, having to plead for my life and my honor before whoever wants to come into the court and listen. For life, I prize it as I weigh grief, which I would spare. My life is grief, I don't want grief, and therefore I don't care about my life. For honor, tis a derivative from me to mine, and only that I stand for. I don't care about being killed here. I care about my honor, because that will be inherited by my children. I appeal to your own conscience, sir, before Polixenes came to your court, how I was in your grace, how merited to be so. Since he came, with what encounter so uncurrent I have strained to appear thus, if one jot beyond the bound of honor, or in act, or will, that way inclining, harden be the hearts of all that hear me, and my nearest of kin cry fie upon my grave. And Leontes says, I ne'er heard yet that any of these bolder vices wanted less impudence to gainsay what they did than to perform it first. In other words, if you're going to do the thing, you'll have the imp impudence to deny it later. That's true enough, she says, though tis a saying, sir, not due to me. You will not own it. More than mistress of which comes to me in name of fault I must not at all acknowledge. I'm not guilty of it, so I'm not going to acknowledge it. For Polixenes, with whom I am accused, I do confess I loved him as in honor he required, with such a kind of love as might become a lady like me, sorry, as might become a lady like me, with a love even such, so and no other, as yourself commanded. Which not to have done, I think, had been in me both disobedience and ingratitude to you and toward your friend, whose love had spoke ever since it could speak from an infant freely that it was yours. Now, for conspiracy, I know not how it tastes, though it be dished for me to try how. That is, I've never engaged in conspiracy. Now there seems to be a conspiracy against me. All I know of it is that Camillo was an honest man. And why he left your court, the gods themselves, wanting no more than I, are ignorant. I don't know why Camillo left. She doesn't know that Leontes tried to get Camillo to poison Polixene. You knew of his departure, as you know what you have undertaken to do in his absence. That is, kill me. Sir, you speak a language that I understand not. My life stands in the level, it is, means in the aim, 
of your dreams, which I'll lay down. I'm willing to lay down my life, but I'm in the bullseye, the target of nothing but dreams. Your actions are my dreams. You had a bastard by Polixenes, and I but dreamed it. And you were past all, sh as you were past all shame, those of your fact, meaning of your faction, are so. So past all truth, which to deny concerns more than avails. For as thy brat hath been cast out, like to itself, no father owning it, which is indeed more criminal in thee than it, so thou shalt feel our justice, in whose easiest passage look for no less than death. Sir, she says, spare your threats. The bug, the bugaboo, which you would fright me with, I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favor, I do give lost. For I do feel it gone, but know not how it went. My second joy, and first fruits of my body, from his presence I am barred like one infectious, that's Mumilius. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast, the innocent milk in its most innocent mouth, hailed out to murder, that's Perdita. Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet, with immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion, belongs to women of all. You've taken me here from uh, just after childbirth. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I've got strength of limit, that is, regained her strength after giving birth. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore, proceed. But yet hear this, mistake me not. No life, I prize it not a straw, but for mine honor, which I would free. If I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proof sleeping else but what your jealousies awake, I tell you tis rigor and not law. Your honors all, I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo, be my judge. So then they bring forth the oracle. Cleomenes and Dion swear that they've been faithful conveyors of the oracle. The auntie says, break up the seals and read, line 130. And this is the oracle. Hermione is chaste. Polixenes, blameless. Camillo, a true subject. Leontes, a jealous tyrant, his innocent babe truly begotten. And the king shall live without an heir, if that which is lost be not found. The lords, everybody, now blessed be the great Apollo. Phew, thank goodness. Praised, says Hermione. Leontes, hast thou read truth? Aye, my lord, even so as it is here set down. There is no truth at all in the oracle. The session shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. <sighs> Remember that rock in the pond with the circles spreading out? Now who's it taking in? My jealousy is real. The oracle is false. He's calling Apollo a liar. Not good to... Uh, Fool Mother Nature. This is mere falsehood. Enter servant. My lord, the king, the king, what is the business? I'll be hated to report it. The prince, your son, is gone. How? Gone. Is dead. Boom. Because the next line is, Apollo's angry. And the heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. What just happened? He realized that he, he wakes up. He wakes up. Not till the death of his son can he see himself 
And the shock of that brings him back to himself. Now, what's he going to do? He doesn't have anyone to stab at. There's no Iago to blame for this. Is he going to kill himself like Othello? Before that, anything can happen. Hermione faints. Why does she faint? She's weak. She's just given birth. And she just heard that her son is dead. So she faints away. <clears throat> Paulina. This news is mortal to the queen. Look down and see what death is doing. Leontes, take her hence. Her heart is but o'er charge. She will recover. I have too much believed mine own suspicion. Beseech you, tenderly apply to her some remedies for life. Save her, right? And then we get his soliloquy. Apollo, pardon my great profaneness against thine oracle. Right? There's no truth at all in the oracle. Pardon my profaneness. I'll reconcile me to Polixenes. New woo my queen. Recall the good Camillo, whom I proclaim a man of truth, of mercy. For being transported by my jealousies to bloody thoughts and to revenge, I chose Camillo for the minister to poison my friend Polixenes, which had been done, but that the good mind of Camillo tardied my swift command, though I with death and with reward did threaten and encourage him, not doing it and being done. He, most humane and filled with honor to my kingly guest, unclasped my practice, that's my plot, quit his fortunes here, which you knew great, and to the hazard of all uncertainties himself commended, no richer than his honor. He put himself uh, at risk and in danger with only his honor intact. How he glisters through my rust and how his piety does my deeds make the blacker. Well, that is thoroughgoing self-recognition, self-proclamation, in fact, before the god. This is all said to Apollo. He knows exactly what he's done. How does this happen to us? I mean, it happens in all kinds of ways. People can fall into an erotic frenzy over someone and then do the most horrible things to try to satisfy that. And then one day wake up and say, why did that even happen? I mean, there's nothing there. That's just, what can I have been thinking? Or any such affectio, envy, jealousy, suspicion, <clears throat> I need a new car. I need a new car. I need, I need, I need, I need. I can't live without. I've got to have one of those. And then you get it and you drive it for a week and then you go, why did I spend all that money? <laughs> it's just the car. <clears throat> why did I obsess? Gideon, why does Shakespeare want us to see this in the king? Because Given the hierarchy, in many instances, the king is next to God. Yes. And so this is his way of telling us that all humans are frail. Good. Okay. Even kings. And it has that much more consequence in a king. It's horrible in a king. And in a person who isn't a king, you can learn from this, not to behave like this to your wife. You have a suspicion, so what? It's got, there's, there's no justification for it if there's no justification for it. But it can be really, really dangerous. And in a king, of course, more so. Yeah? It brings back to me the, the power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolute. I don't think that's what he means here. It's okay. not because he's a king okay. that he's fallen into this. Because Polixenes is also a king, and he has not fallen into this. Later, he kind of does. Later, he kind well, for a different reason. We'll see. You're right. There are parallels. But I don't think it's because of the power. It's because of the power that he can cause so much havoc. Right, right. That is true. What was your question? I was going to say there's a lot of discussion in here as to whether 
uh, Leontes is a tyrant, and Leontes is quite uh, firm in denying that he's a tyrant. But the oracle says he is. Yes. So. And he has. So he's. So you know, you talk about rebellion. He's he's rebelling against an even higher power. Yes, but he begins by rebelling against himself, yeah. and then uh, betraying because of that rebellion within him. He's betraying the queen and everybody else. But finally, you're right. He's rebelling against Apollo himself because he denies the truth of the oracle. And then that justifies, you know, bad stuff happening. Yes, exactly. But it, it, it's all part of the same arc, right? Yeah. It's not just that, but that's the climax of it. But what, I mean, there's discussion early on about how his brain has been infected and the, the planets, there's an ill-favored planet what can you do about that? Right. Good question. That's why it's so horrible. Because there's no cause for this. Yeah. I mean, in Othello, we had a cause, Iago. Right. Exactly. But what's the cause of Iago? It's equally mysterious. Why is there a demon, Iago, trying to do this? It's, we're all subject to it, and we don't know why. But when we're affected by it, we can learn from this what not to do. What were you going to say? Is of nature. Of course. It's the, <clears throat> the ignoring of the oracle, or in fact, not just ignoring, but the denying of its truth, is the climactic uh, act of Leontes of betrayal that's been building, 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 building. So he, he doesn't trust his wife, he doesn't trust his friend, he doesn't trust Camillo, he's accused the lords, Antigonus, Paulina, the baby isn't his, his wife is, and finally he calls the gods, he calls Apollo a liar. And that's the limit. That's the gods are willing to let him, you know, dole out enough rope for him to hang himself. And that's the limit. But what is more important to a male king than his heir? Right. And if he doesn't listen to this, he will have no heir. Correct. So it's a huge What's more important to him than his heir? Nothing. And you're right. And the oracle says so. He will live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. The daughter he rejected because the son is taken from him. Right. But that's what kind of turned around in the first place because he was worried about the legitimacy of the... Well, yeah. But he was more worried about his suspicion about that legitimacy. He made that his God. And now it's come back to, to punish him. If you're a lawyer. If you're a lawyer. Okay. So he asked the question of Apollo and he didn't know the answer to it. So but he thought he did. He thought he did. But, but, but if you don't know. So I mean, what kind of lawyer is he? It's a, he's a lousy one. He's a lousy lawyer. But if he, was so, if he was so powerful that he could, in a sense, silence Camillo, who's his closest aide. Yes. Closest, who knows you know, who's been his priest, who knows uh, all of his inner workings. Yes. Why does he care about public opinion? Why can't he just uh, snuff or push down everybody else and, uh, and be the tyrant? If he doesn't ask Apollo... Uh, you mean, why does he ask Apollo instead of not asking Apollo? Well, I don't... Yeah, I mean, he probably could have gotten away with it, right? Because he's the king. Does he not fear rebellion from the people? Yeah, he needs to persuade the people, and he feels, he says, he believes that he knows the truth, yeah. but the oracle will convince the people if they don't believe him. Because everybody he talks to is saying, no, that can't be right. And they're right, but he's not believing it. So he has to go to the limit to convince them. Otherwise, he has no, he's not a king if he doesn't have, you know, people. So that belies the, the kingship. Theory, right. Like divine right. You, you can't. No, you no, gotta, it doesn't. You've got to have some buy in. What do you mean buy in? From the people? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right. So you're not just totally, uh, you know, all powerful. You don't. You, you have to. The king was never thought to be God. The fact that he rules by divine right doesn't mean he's a God and doesn't have to care. He, remember that he is not just. Um, 
in a position of power over people. He's also responsible for their good. He's supposed to be a steward. Yes. And in treating his wife this way, he's undermining the whole stability of the state, which is what Camillo says to him. What were you going to say? No, it's okay. you know my opinion of, of him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, that's not the worst that happens. His son dies, and then Paulina comes in, and she says, line 170, Woe the while, O oh, cut my lace, lest my heart cracking it break too. Paulina to Leontes. What studied torments, tyrant, hast for me? What wheels, racks, fires, what flaying, boiling in leads or oils, what old or newer torture must I receive, whose every word deserves to taste of thy most worst? Thy tyranny, together working with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine. Oh, think what they have done, and then run mad indeed, stark mad, for all thy bygone fooleries were but spices of it. That thou betrayedst Polixenes, twas nothing. That did but show thee of a fool, inconstant and damnable ingrateful. Nor was it much thou wouldst have poisoned good Camillo's honor to have him kill a king. Poor trespasses, more monstrous standing by, not so much considering what you did then. Whereof I reckon the casting forth to crows thy baby daughter to be one, to be none or little, though a devil would have shed water out of fire ere done it. Nor is it directly laid to thee the death of the young prince, whose honorable thoughts, thoughts high for one so tender, cleft the heart that could conceive a gross and foolish sire, blemished his gracious dam. This is not, no, laid to thy answer. Now, this is a great rhetorical device. You're pretending to throw these things aside, but you're not really throwing them aside because you're saying them. So it adds up. But the last, O oh lords, when I have said, cry woe, the queen, the queen, the sweetest, dearest creature's dead, and vengeance for it not dropped down yet. Lord, the higher powers forbid. I say she's dead. I'll swear it. Does she swear it? To say, I will swear it? Are you swearing it? No. If word nor oath prevail not, go and see. If you can bring tincture or luster in her lip, her eye, heat outwardly or breath within, I'll serve you as I would do the gods. If you can bring her back to life, I would serve you as I would the gods. But, O oh, thou tyrant, do not repent these things, for they are heavier than all thy woes can stir. Therefore betake thee to nothing but despair. A thousand knees, ten thousand years together, naked, fasting upon a barren mountain, and still winter in storm perpetual, could not move the gods to look that way thou wert. He says, go on, go on. Thou canst not speak too much. I have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. Lord, say no more. However the business goes, you have made fault in the boldness of your speech. Paulina, I am sorry for it. All faults I make when I shall come to know them, I do repent. Alas, I have showed too much the rashness of a woman. He is touched to the noble heart. He still got a noble heart. It went wrong in all this period, but he's got a noble heart. What's gone and what's past help should be past grief. Do not receive affliction at my petition. I beseech you rather, let me be punished that have minded you of what you should forget. Now, good my liege, sir, royal sir, forgive a foolish woman. Okay, fine, she feels like she's gone too far and she's asking for forgiveness, but it's, she's not done. But she also sees that he's... Repentant, repentant. yes. The love I bore your queen, lo, fool again, I'll speak no, of her no more, nor of your children. I'll not remember you of my own Lord, who is lost too. Take your patience to you, and I'll say nothing. I actually find it interesting, I mean, there she's, you know, saying that she's 
lost her husband too, but in in her, you know, like what tyranny, whatever, uh, she says, um, where have I reckoned the casting forth of crows, thy baby daughter, um, though a devil would have shed water, air, whatever, a devil would have shed tears out of fire, air done it. Yeah. So, I mean, and she's talking about her husband there. Well, he's the one no, the, she's imagined, she, he is. But remember that he made an oath to do it. So he's caught between a rock and a hard place and he's gonna die for it. But um, he didn't want to do it. And he was shedding tears. So, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so I don't think we're to think that she means him because she, she knows that he was sworn to go do it. And he's, he's lost to her because of Leontes, not because he wanted to go expose the child. And also she's being hyperbolical about the devil. So, and Camillo never swore his allegiance, because he... Right. He, so he had, now he swore allegiance to Leontes, he, but he, he didn't swear that he would do it. He just said he would do it. Yeah. He's not breaking an oath. I mean, he's breaking an oath to be loyal to Leontes, but not, he's not loyal to Leontes' madness, to his affectio. Right, but the question is, did he swear that he would poison Polixenes? No, I don't think he swore. Let's see. Uh, Act 1, Scene 2. I could do this. I, I do, and we'll fetch Bohemia off for it. I'll do it, provided that you so and so and so. I am his cupbearer. If from me he have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. That's what he says. And he does have wholesome be beverage, and he's not going to be accounted his servant for 14 years, or however many, how is it? 16 years. 14. All right, so uh, Paulina has said, take your patience to you and I'll say nothing. And Leontes says, thou didst speak but well when most the truth, which I receive much better than to be pitied of thee. That is, I liked what you said the first time when you were yelling at me. Prithee, bring me to the dead bodies of my queen and son. One grave shall be for both. Upon them shall the causes of their death appear unto our shame perpetual. We're gonna write on the tomb, why they died. My fault. Once a day I'll visit the chapel where they lie, and tears shed there shall be my recreation. So long as nature will bear up with this exercise, so long I daily vow to use it. That is, I vow to use it daily. Come and lead me to these sorrows. End of Act 3, Scene 2. Act 3, scene 3, we get Antigonus come in with the infant and he tells us a story of a vision. They don't want to be doing this. The heavens are angry. There's a big storm brewing. This is a dangerous place, says the mariner. Be careful around here. It is like to be loud weather, he says. Besides, this place is famous for the creatures of prey that keep upon it. So those are the two predictions of the two uh, destructions that are about to happen. Now Antigonus has a long soliloquy. Come, poor babe, he says. I have heard but not believed. The spirits of the dead may walk again. If such thing be, thy mother appeared to me last night, for ne'er was dream so like awaking. To me comes a creature, sometimes her head on one side, some another. I never saw a vessel of like sorrow, so filled and so becoming. In pure white robes, like very sanctity, she did approach my cabin where I lay. Now, this is a vision in his dream, and we are to take it as a true vision, which in a sense it is, of Hermione, dead, in heaven, coming to him. Thrice bowed before me, and gasping to begin some speech, her eyes became two spouts. The fury spent anon did this break from her. So this is what the spirit of Hermione 
in his dream says to him, good Antigonus, since fate against thy better disposition, in other words, not like a devil, hath made thy person for the thrower out of my poor babe, according to thine oath, places remote enough are in Bohemia. There weep and leave it crying. And, for the babe is counted lost forever, Perdita, I prithee call it. For this ungentle business put on thee by my Lord, thou ne'er shalt see thy wife Paulina more. Go to Bohemia. If you're going to expose the child, expose the child in Bohemia. And your doom is never to see your wife again. And so with shrieks she melted into air. Affrighted much, I did in time collect myself and thought this was so and no slumber. Dreams are toys, that is, trifles, mere nothings. Yea, yet for this once, yea, superstitiously, I will be squared by this. I do believe Hermione hath suffered death, and we've heard Paulina say so. And that Apollo would, this being indeed the issue of King Polixenes, it should here be laid, either for life or death, upon the earth of its right father. Blossom to the child, speed thee well. There lie, and there thy character. That's your description, your, your bio. There are these, which may, if fortune please, both breed thee pretty and still rest thine. That is, they'll pay for your upbringing and still be yours, if you're fortunate. The storm begins. Poor wretch, that for thy mother's fault are thus exposed to loss and what may follow. Weep I cannot, but my heart bleeds. So the devil would have shed tears out of fire ere done it. He can't, he's not weeping, but his heart is bleeding. And most accursed am I to be by oath enjoined to this. Farewell. The day frowns more and more. Thou art like to have a lullaby too rough. I never saw the heavens so dim by day. When were the heavens dim by day? The crucifixion, yes. Of yes, here. that's right, and was put to death because he's seen her as a spirit, so he assumes she's dead. And he doesn't know what happened at court. He's gone. He was gone, right? So he thinks she, she was executed. Oh, so was but, but he also, I mean, before he didn't believe that that's she right. was untrue, but now he is believing. Because of this vision. Oh. She seems to be dead and coming to him as a spirit. Yes. I think it's softening his commitment. Softening his commitment to what? That, that, to, that he would take the child and just abandon it and leave it to die. What's softening it? Um, what's his name? Um, Antigonus. Antigonus, thank you. Antigonus is committed, or tells Leonis he's totally committed to do anything he wants. Yes. And now he's found out that what he's committed to is against Apollo. Is against God. So it's no. 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 He's had a vision of the dead Hermione coming to him right. and saying, since you've sworn to throw out this child, throw it out in Bohemia. And he thinks, oh, I guess it's because Polixenes is the father. Okay. And, Le and Hermione was put to death <laughs> by Leontes because she was unfaithful. In other words, he gets it wrong by the power of that vision. No, the child is exposed to the wild. And the shepherds picked up, that's it. Yeah, okay. and we're going to see that right now. Although, although he might, well, we're going to read Let's read it. The, yeah, the Let's read it or I'm going to run out of time and you'll have to wait till Thursday. <laughs> Farewell, thou, the day frowns more and more. Thou art like to have a lullaby too rough. This is a wild neighborhood and it's a storm. I never saw the heavens so dim by day. Then he hears a savage clamor. Well, may I get aboard. Then he sees the bear. This is the chase. I am gone forever. And we have this famous stage direction 
probably the most famous stage direction in Shakespeare, exit pursued by a bear. <laughs> Down the street from the globe was the bear baiting pit. And a bear baiting pit was a big theater like the globe, round, open to the sky, with a post buried in the earth in the middle. <clears throat> to the post, they would uh, tie by the neck a captured bear, or by the leg, I think. Was it by the leg or the neck? Uh, a captured bear from the woods. And then they would set bull mastiff dogs to attack the bear. And the bear would attack the dogs back. And they would bet on whether the bear would survive the dogs and kill them first, or the dogs would succeed in killing the bear. And that was, that was their uh, kind of entertainment. So, you know, you'd say to your wife, let's go across the river today. What would you rather see, King Lear or the bear baiting? OK. So that's why there's a bear here. Um, it's probably somebody in a bear suit. Um, but they might have had a trained bear. We don't really know. Probably not. Probably someone in a bear costume. Out he goes. OK, so my question is, when he says, this is the chase, is he not like? Haunting the bear, like come after me, and and kind of sparing because I've seen it staged. Oh, I see. Yeah. Trying to save the child. Yeah. Not in the words. This is. Uh oh, the, the bear's after me. I better get out of here, and the bear chases him. I don't think he's thinking about saving the child at this Unless point. Unless he says, you know, this is the chase, meaning you know. To the bear. To the bear. Chase me. Yeah. I see. Uh. I mean, I suppose you could do it that way. I, I don't see it in the words, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could, I suppose. It doesn't. The version I'm watching didn't play it that way. Yeah, it doesn't harm his he character, sets, but. He sets the basket down and he starts walking away, and then there's, and the, then there's the bear chasing him. Yeah. He has some expectation of the child's because he needs money. Right. He's hoping the child gets found. But it's a not propitious day for it. The wild bear is out, and the storm is brewing. And wasn't he told somewhere or something? I mean, he says before, I'm going to leave money with, yeah. with the baby bird. Yeah, he, he has yeah. left. Okay. He has. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Exit pursued by a bear. Enter shepherd. <laughs> prose, OK? Big shift from the verse speech of Antigonus to the prose of the shepherd. I would there were no age between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest. For there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. Hark you not. They didn't have Adderall. <laughs> Hark you now. Would any but these boiled brains of 19 and 2 and 20 hunt this weather? Shakespeare is right. You know, the, prefrontal cortex doesn't finish growing until the age of 25, mm -hmm. which is the part of the brain that's in charge of making judgments based on future possibilities and consequences. And we know this from our teenagers. They have scared away two of my best sheep, which I fear the wolf will sooner find than the master. If anywhere I have them, tis by the seaside browsing of ivy. Good luck and be thy will. And then he sees the child. What have we here? Mercy on us, a barn, meaning a baby, a very pretty barn. A boy or a child, I wonder, meaning a boy or a girl. A pretty one, a very pretty one. Sure, some scape, some escape. Though I am not bookish, yet I can read waiting gentlewoman in the scape. That is, she got pregnant out of wedlock, and she dumped the child here because she didn't want to be dishonored. This has been some stair work some trunk work, some behind door work. They were warmer that got this than the poor thing is here. I'll take it up for pity, yet I'll tarry till my son come. He hallowed, but even now, whoa, whoa, ho! What art so near if thou see a thing to talk on when thou art de dead and rotten? So this is comedy, right? If you want to see something that you can talk about when you're dead and rotten, come hither. The clown comes in. Clown means country bumpkin. It doesn't mean a circus clown. It doesn't mean that he's particularly funny. He's just an un kind of tutored country bumpkin. 
I have seen two such sights by sea and by land, but I am not to say it is a sea, for it is now the sky. Betwixt the firmament and it, you cannot thrust a bodkin's point, uh, thrust a bodkin's point, uh, the point of a dagger. I would you did but see how it chafes, how it rages, how it takes up the shore, that is the ocean. But that's not to the point. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls on the ship, that is, that has brought Perdita to this shore with Antigonus. Sometimes to see him and not to see him. Now the ship boring the moon with her mainmast and anon swallowed with yeast and froth as you thrust a cork into a hogshead. And then for the land service to see how the bear tore out his shoulder bone, how he cried to me for help and said his name was Antigonus, a nobleman. But to make an end of the ship, to see how the sea flap dragoned it. But first, how the poor souls roared and the sea mocked them, and how the poor gentleman roared and the bear mocked him, both roaring louder than the sea or weather. Name of mercy, when was this boy? Now, now, I have not winked since I saw these sights. The men are not yet cold under water, nor the bear half dined on the gentleman. He's at it now. Would I had been by to have helped the old man. I would you had been by shipside to have helped her. There your charity would have lacked footing. Heavy matters, heavy matters. Okay, so the ship has gone down that took Perdita to be exposed. Antigonus has been eaten by a bear. It's a tragic comedy in that sense. There are significant deaths. First, Mamilius, of course then Hermione, as we think, and then Antigonus and the, sea, the seafarers. Now bless thyself, says the shepherd, <clears throat> and this is the turning point of the play. Thou met'st with things dying, I with things newborn. Here's a sight for thee, look thee, a bearing cloth for a squire's child, look thee here. Take up, open it, let's see. It was told me I should be rich by the fairies. This is some changeling. It's changed in by the fairies. The clown looks in and sees, you're a maid, old man. If the sins of your youth are forgiven, you're well to live. Gold, all gold. This is fairy gold, boy, and twill prove so. Up with it, keep it close. Home, home, the next way. We are lucky, boy, and to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. Let my sheep go. Come, good boy, the next way home. Go you the next way with your findings. I'll go see if the bear be gone from the gentleman and how much he hath eaten. They are never cursed but when they are hungry. If there be any of him left, I'll bury it. What is that kind of deed of the shepherd boy? A good deed. Bury the dead. And the, the old, that's the young shepherd is burying the old dead. And the old shepherd is picking up the young, innocent child. They're both doing good deeds. That's a good deed, says the shepherd. If thou, I see, I don't have to tell you anything. It's all right here. That's a good deed. If thou mayest discern by that which is left of him what he is, fetch me to the sight of him. Mary will I, says the clown, and you shall help to put him in the ground. Tis a lucky day, boy. Now, lucky doesn't just mean good lucky. It's good luck and evil luck both happening at the same time. Bad luck to Antigonus and the seafarers, good luck to the bear and the child and these two men. Tis a lucky day, boy, and we'll do good deeds on it. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to do the best we can. All right, I'm going to stop there because the real turning point, the, the, the moral or metaphorical turning point is dying and newborn. Is it not what? Isn't the turning point when the oracle... Uh, no, there's downward motion. And it's the turning point is for Leontes when, when he hears that Mamilius is dead. Um, we know that she's innocent, so the oracle doesn't surprise us. Mm -hmm. What surprises us is the king shall live without an heir unless that which is lost, until that which is lost be found, okay? So then we hear that Mamilius has died, that's the turning for Leontes. But then we hear that Hermione's died. Then we see Antigonus eaten by a bear and the ship go down. So all of that is down, 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 negative, negative, negative. Yeah. 
Now, the positive is hinted at because the shepherd picks up the child and takes it to save it. It's not going to die out there. So that's, that's kind of a turning point. But the, the dramatic turning point, the major turning point, is this uh, Act 4, Scene 1 prologue, which is the chorus time the chorus comes in and says radically, 14 years have passed since what you just saw. And that is an intentional break of what were called the, the unities of time, place, and action. And the Elizabethans touted the unities. They said they were for them, but they broke them when they needed to. And Shakespeare breaks them particularly whenever he needs to. And in this play, he breaks the unity of time as extravagantly as he ever has. 14 years go by with no drama on the stage. So we'll talk about that on Thursday. But uh, for now, I'm out of time. But I'll take questions if you have questions. Yes? What year? I think it's 1611 uh, or 12. So 11, maybe. That was after James came to the throne. Yes, oh yes. That whole deal had been settled. It's the next to last uh, play of Shakespeare's before The Tempest, and then he retires to Stratford. And then he writes Henry VIII and uh, parts of Two Noble Kinsmen, I think, or he may have written those before, I'm not sure. It doesn't get published till later or played till later. But um, I, I think the Tempest epilogue is about retiring from the stage. I believe that. So he, that's in 1613. Okay, but the whole deal about Elizabeth not having an heir, that's all No, that's past. That's been resolved. Yeah. That's all done. Yeah, but not having an heir is important. I mean, James needs to have an heir, too. Yeah. So good question. Others? You see the metaphysical element in this speech by time. Metaphysical? Of course. Yeah. I mean, it depends what you mean by that. Well, it, it means a lot of things, but to me, there's it, it's just the way he talks about time itself. Yes. Overwhelmed custom. Oh, time. yes, yes, yes. Things like that. The power of time. Yeah, that he's saying it's almost fungible in a way. It's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll read the whole speech carefully, and we'll, <laughs> you can bring up whatever metaphysics you want to out of it. <laughs> we'll get there. OK, so we are triumphant in finishing Act 3 uh, in one evening. And that leaves me two hours to do Acts 4 and 5. However, Act 4 is the longest single scene in all of Shakespeare. Um, and there's a lot going on. We're not going to read all of it, but we'll read a good chunk of it. OK, see you Thursday. Thank you so much. <laughs>